Uh, Would you open your Bibles this morning to Acts chapter 16? Uh, Before we get there, we're going to jump into the book of Proverbs. Uh, Today is the fifth, um, and so we're going to dive into chapter five of Proverbs. Now, let me just say this. Chapter five of Proverbs, um, if you're not familiar with it, which you probably don't have it memorized would be my guess, uh, is it's all about a father warning his son about adultery. Uh, And so this, this is coming after that, and, and I want to read this to you. It says in verse 22 and 23, it says, The iniquities of the wicked ensnare him, and he is held fast in the cords of his sin. Listen to this. He dies for lack of discipline. Because of his great folly, he is led astray. This is like wrapping up a, a whole section on, on adultery, on not being led into um, a, adultery. And it says that he dies for lack of discipline. And I, let me just ask you this morning real quick before we jump into the message. I'm going to bring heat before we even get into the message. What are some areas of your life that need more discipline, that you could increase discipline? Because let me, let me tell you this, is that discipline, a, a life of discipline leads to, to discipline. If you get disciplined in, in small areas, it will slowly grow into discipline in other areas of your life. And so I would just encourage you, what's one thing that you can become more disciplined in this week that will help grow bigger disciplines? All right? Okay. <laughs> Guys, we're supposed to be wide awake this morning. <laughs> Is it just me? Don't leave me hanging here. So I, we're, gonna, we're, we're coming into the, the close today of a series that we've been in that I've titled Authentic Worship. And we've been exploring the idea of what does it mean to worship God authentically? And w- really, what is worship? Why do we worship? Who do we worship? How do we worship? How does it impact our life? Those are the things that we've explored throughout this series. And the reason that we're here is at the beginning of 2023, the, the Lord gave us a word um, to be established in faith. And I believe for us to be established in faith, we have to have a firm foundation on worship. And so we spent a lot of this year kind of building some foundational blocks of our faith so that we could stand firm on our faith. And so we're closing this this um, time in worship, and we're going to talk about the impact that worship has on our life. And we're going to look at Acts chapter 16, um, a really powerful story. We're going to start in verse 25 here. It says this, about midnight, how many of you guys are awake at midnight? Not anymore. How many of you guys were up at midnight praying and singing hymns to God? Look at, look at these two men. How many of you were last night at midnight in jail praying and singing hymns to God? This is where Paul and Silas are. It says that about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Now, I can only imagine that, of course, the prisoners are listening because it's midnight, and there's two guys down the row, and they're singing, and they won't be quiet. But that's not listening. That's just hearing. Listening is like, what are they, what are they singing? And, and they're really like listening and in tune and, and paying attention to. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open and everybody's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped because he knew that if all of the prisoners had escaped, they were going to come and kill him. So he might as well just take care of it now. But Paul cried with a loud voice, do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for the lights and rushed in, trembling with fear. He fell down before Paul and Silas 
And then he brought them out and says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, washed their wounds. And then he was baptized at once, he and all his family. And they brought them up into his house and set food before them. And then he rejoiced along with his entire household that they had believed in God. What a powerful moment. Let's spend a moment in, in prayer as we dive into the scripture this morning. Father, we thank you that, Lord, that we get to be in your house, Lord. I pray that you would speak to us this morning. Uh, would your word come alive in our lives, Lord? I pray that, um, Lord, that, that you, would, you would speak something new and fresh through your word today. Lord, I pray where we, we need correction, Lord, that you would correct. Um, Lord, we thank you for your word, and we pray that you would bless this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation and suddenly it, it changed, it shifted. I know, uh, you know, weather might be a great example, especially living in, in the Northwest. Sometimes it's like, especially when we get into spring, you know, everybody loves spring in the Northwest where it's like, it's sunny, it's beautiful. And then five minutes later, it's raining. And then five minutes later, there's lightning. And then five minutes later, it's snowing. And then five minutes later, there's hail. And you're like, can you make up your mind? Like suddenly the weather keeps, keeps changing. We got to spend some time uh, this summer uh, in the Tetons, which was, just, which was beautiful. But the weather there was so interesting that this time when we were there because like every day it was just beautiful. And then the evening would roll around and then suddenly it would shift. And the first night that we were there, we, we walked out to the lake and we're kind of like just watching and suddenly the, the wind starts to come in. And then the clouds over top of the Tetons, it was like a great picture. They just start to grow dark and then lightning starts to crack across the mountains. And it was like this cool moment of all of a sudden this storm just rolled over the top of the mountains and then it was dumping rain. And it was like, it was beautiful coming in and beautiful like the whole day. And then suddenly it, it just shifted. And I don't know if you've had moments of suddenlies in your life, but I, that's what I want to talk to. I want to preach to you a sermon this morning that I've titled, And Suddenly. And Suddenly. It says this, it says, about midnight, Paul and Silas, they were praying, they were singing hymns to God, the prisoners were listening to them, and suddenly... And suddenly there was a great earthquake. And suddenly the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bonds were unfastened. I believe that, that our God is a God that moves in the suddenly. But here's this. I believe that when we choose to worship and place our focus and attention on to God, that's when he begins to suddenly move and work on our behalf. Let me ask you this this morning. Where do you need God to suddenly show up? What's the situation that, that you need God to show up in the suddenly? That's what we're going to kind of speak to this morning, that where do we need God to show up? But I want to, as we dive in, I want to give us a little bit of backstory to how it is that Paul and Silas have come to be in this prison. Why are they there? This is kind of the beginning. They're in a place called Philippi. And this is kind of the beginning, if you will, of the church of Philippi. Paul, Silas, Timothy, um, and Luke, are they're, they're together here preaching in Philippi. And they've been there for a little while. And they're, they're staying with this woman who has just been saved. There's this uh, kind of miraculous thing that happens uh, towards the beginning of uh, chapter 16. This woman hears the word of the Lord. She gets saved, immediately baptized. And then she says, hey, come, come stay at my house. Make this kind of your home base. And so that's what they do. And every day they're going out to the place where this woman was saved. And it's become this place of prayer for them. And so they're going out every day. But while they're going out daily to preach and teach the word, there's a, there's a woman who has come and she's, 
She's following them. And like every single day, this woman is following them, and this woman is possessed by a, a, a demon. And th- this woman is mocking them. Here's what she's saying in verse 16 and 17. As we were going to the place of prayer, this is Luke writing in the first person here. We were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. So she's, a, she's slave to some guys and they're, they're using her essentially demon possession to gain money because she's telling fortunes to people. She followed Paul and us crying out, these men are servants of the Most High who proclaim to you the way of salvation. It's interesting that, that sometimes truth can be found even in those who don't submit to the truth. She might be stating truth, but she's in no way submitted to the truth. And over time, this mocking, it finally gets the the best of Paul, and he acts on it in, uh, in verse 18. He says this, And this she kept doing for many days, just following and taunting. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, you know, part of me, like, has a little bit of assurance, like, okay, I'm not the only one. Paul dealt with an annoyance as well. <laughs> Paul, becoming greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. He just turns and he says, be done. I'm done listening to you. Be done. But the owners of this slave girl, they're kind of enraged because their prophet just, like, walked out the door. Their money making, their whole business plan just like went up in flames in this one moment. And they're like, dude, why would you do that to us? And so they they take Paul, they grab him and Silas, and they drag them before the leaders of the marketplace. They condemn them, and then they, they beat them. It says this in verse 22 and 24, the crowd joined in attacking them. So it's not just these men that are beating him. Now there's a whole crowd that is attacking Paul and Silas. And the magistrates tore their garments off of them and gave them orders to beat them with rods. So not only have they just endured a a mob-like attacking, but now the leaders have have stripped them of their, their clothes and started to beat them with rods. When they had felt like they had inflicted enough blows, it says when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison. And then it says they ordered the jailer to keep them safely. They gave the jailer this command, like, I want you to really guard these guys. Don't let them out. Don't don't just give them an easy spot. I want you to put them in deep. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison, and then it says, and fastened their feet in the stocks. This, like, wasn't a good place to be. You know, this wasn't just like a a modern jailhouse. This is a dark dungeon that they've placed them into. They're in in the, the pits, and it says that they didn't just put them in shackles. They put them into stocks, literally wood bars with holes cut out that, that they tightened and fastened around their legs. And actually, the, some of the, the Roman prisons, they would have stocks that had like varying widths, and they would slowly spread your legs apart. So you were just immensely uncomfortable. And if, and if you've seen before, um, you know, the, these stocks, they would, they would hold, and it was two, two pieces of wood that would clamp around, and you were forced to be in a sitting upright position. But not only this, uh, you know, for Paul and Silas, luckily they didn't get, like, the full torture of this, because they had stocks that would hold both the, the legs and then also the head and the feet, or, and the hands, to where you, like, could not move. Imagine the torture of being in this. But, but still, these men have just been beaten. And so they're, they're bruised, they're bloody, they've got cuts, all of the sorts. And there's no way for them to get comfortable because 
the way that their legs are locked and bound in this place. This this is like your worst day. They they're in like when you say I'm down in the pits, like they were really down in the pits, locked and bound, covered in in beatings. This is their worst day. They're in a dungeon, they're cold, they're suffering from wounds, legs locked, they can't move. They're in pain and misery. For what? Calling a demon out of a girl? But here's what I want to look at. Where do they set their hearts? They're in absolute agony. And what do they do? They begin to worship. They begin to pray and to sing hymns and to praise. I don't know about your worst day when everything has gone completely wrong, but I can say this, that worship, it's not always my first stop. Now, I, might, I, I may be going to the Lord, but I might not be going in worship. I might be going in like, pleading my case before the Lord. How can you do this? Why am I here? And those things, that's not their heart. Their heart is, Lord, you're good. Lord, you're worthy. We're going to praise you. Even in this situation, I'm going to worship you. Not I'm going to come before you with my need. And that's, that's an easy place to go where, Lord, how are we in this position? Lord, save us from this. And they go, Lord, you are holy. Lord, you are worthy. Silas, let's sing songs to God. What, what if we just begin to sing? My soul needs to worship in this moment. Lord, you're worthy. Even in this situation, I'm going to choose to praise you. And it's such a shock to the other prisoners. Can you imagine being in prison and you watch these guys who are just freshly beaten, bodies destroyed, locked up, and then they just begin to sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. I don't know what they sang, but they began to sing and to praise. And then the prisoners begin to listen intently. These guys that are in prison with them were changed because Paul and Silas chose to pray. I love this, that when the suddenly takes place for Paul and Silas, they don't leave. Their their bounds are broken. The doors flung open, and not just for them, but for every prisoner in there, they stay. They all stay. It says this, when the jailer woke up, <clears throat> verse 16 and 17, sorry, 27 through 30. <laughs> when the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors were open, he drew his sword. He's about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, do not harm yourself, for we are all here. Not a single prisoner had left and escaped. The the moment of worship and praise and the suddenly that happens is so powerful that even these other guys are going, I I don't want to leave. Whatever these guys have to offer is the thing I need. I don't need the escape from the prison. I need the content to be in this place and still worship. I don't know what they got, but I want that. That's where they are. They don't, nobody leaves. Their choice to worship not only impacted and changed their situation, but it affected the situation of every single person around them at the time. Their worship was a testimony to the prisoners and to the jailers. When we choose to worship, when we choose to set our our hearts to praise, God begins to show up in the suddenly. 
there's a reason that Israel sent in worshipers before the army. Because our worship has power. It impacts the people around us. It affects our situation. And it's for the benefit of everybody when we choose to worship. I don't know. Do you need walls like Jericho to fall in your life? Do you need prison foundations to be shaken? Do you need doors to be flung open? Do you need chains to be broken? Do you need sun stand still type of moments in your life? I believe that they come when we set our heart to worship. Not to, not to receive, not to plead, but when we set our heart to worship. This morning, I want to take a look at the ways that worship can suddenly impact your circumstance. First point is this, is that worship invites the Spirit. That might seem maybe like a, a, an elementary thought to you if you've been with, with Christ for any bit of time, but I want you to understand the power of that statement. Understand what it means when the Spirit is invited into your situation. The, I, I love the book of Acts. Everybody knows that the, the book of Acts, it's, it's about the early church. Um, some would call it like the history of the early church, but I think it's so much more than that. If you look at Acts chapter 1, it's not going to come up on the screen. I'm going to flip there. It says this. <clears throat> this is the purpose of the book um, as it opens. It says, in the first book, this is Luke writing about the gospel of Luke. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day that he was taken up. Luke, the book of Luke, deals with all that Jesus began to do and teach physically here on earth. Acts isn't just a, a history lesson for us on the early church. It's the continuation of the gospel of Luke, of the things that Jesus continued to do now through his Holy Spirit empowering his apostles. It's the story of what the Holy Spirit begins to do in and through the apostles. It's Jesus' continuation. The things he began to do and teach are continuing now his work through the Holy Spirit. When we engage in praise, the Spirit invades the place we are. When we engage in, in worship and praise and adoration, it invades our place and it impacts our circumstance. Um, Psalm 22, 3 says, Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. The King James says um, that he is inhabiting the praises of his people. That word there, enthroned, translated inhabit, it literally means to dwell and to abide. That when we choose to worship, when we choose to praise, the Spirit of God begins to make a dwelling within that worship, within that praise. When we choose to praise, we invite the Spirit into our circumstance. So God literally comes and makes His dwelling upon our worship. Not upon our requests, not upon our needs, but upon our praise. God, you're holy. God, you're worthy. God, you have glory and honor above everything else. Praise to him. Jesus tells us this. He says, where two or three are gathered in my name, he is there also. That verse is specifically talking about when we need wisdom. When we need wisdom and we're gathered in, in his name, it's like he's sitting there with us to, to give us wisdom. What would you do? What would you do to have Jesus physically present sitting in your situation? Maybe you look at your situation and, and you might understand, Lord, I, f I feel you with me. But how much more would your mindset shift if he was physically sitting next to you, in your chains, in your bound, 
if he was sitting next to you? How would that affect the way that you look at your situation? I think if the book of Acts declares anything to us, it's that him spiritually sitting next to you is just as powerful as his physical presence next to you. The apostles no longer had him physically present, but the, the signs and the wonders and the things that they began to do because he was, his Holy Spirit was now present inside of them. How would that impact and shift the way that you look at your circumstance right now? I mean, God, you are here. You're sitting right next to me, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to praise you. Number two, worship shakes foundations and it breaks chains. I don't know the kind of uh, prison, maybe the kind of bondage that, that you feel holding you back or weighing you down right now. But Jesus wants to invade that place. And he wants to, to shake prison foundations. He wants to break shackles free. Here's what I love about them. They didn't fight the prison. They didn't come out against it. They didn't fight it. They didn't fight the shackles. They just simply said, I'm here and I still choose to worship you. That's a, such a powerful place to be. Uh, that I, it, whatever place I am, Lord, I'm going to worship. I'm going to praise you. I'm going to lift up praises to you. God doesn't need you to fight his battle. God doesn't need you to fight your battles. He needs to, you to see where you are and choose to still worship. Choose to still praise. Number three, worship testifies to the broken. Not one single prisoner left. These are prisoners, bad dudes, bad boys, bad boys. That's who these guys are. They're, they're not good, good guys. They're in prison for a reason. They have, no, they have no reason to want to hang out there. They've just been freed, but they don't go running out. They go running to Paul and Silas. I'm pretty sure, you know, the, the text doesn't say, but he goes, we're all here. We're all here. I just wonder, were they still in their cells or did they come running to Paul and Silas? We, we need what you have. Need what you have. I think they realize you must serve a pretty big God. I don't know who he is. It's like that moment that, that Nebuchadnezzar's servant looks in and he goes, hey, how many guys were in there? Three? There's four. Come look, there, there, there's four in there. It spoke to the jailer and his whole family got saved. Here's who needs to see your worship in the midst of your worst day. Who needs to see the testimony of you on your knees praising Jesus in the midst of your worst days. Imagine the impact that that choice will have on your family, on your friends, on your kids, when they witness you choosing to praise the Lord in the middle of your worst days. Our God moves in worship. He inhabits our praises and he shows up in our situation when we choose to praise him. That's the truth. I want to give you a few practical ways that we can praise in whatever situation that we find ourselves. This is what I would call, this is authentic worship. When we choose to, to worship God in, in these ways, 
These are, these are simple, and they're going to be quick. Number one, we choose to praise who he is. Here's authentic worship. I'm going to declare who you are. I'm going to praise who you are. You are God. I'm going to praise you for that. You're God, I'm not. You are worthy. It is who you are. You are holy. It is who you are. These are praises to God. I know that we have so many worship songs to choose from and things that, that make us feel good, but I can tell you authentic worship is when we choose to say things like, God, you're God. God, you are holy. God, you are worthy. It can be as simple as that. That is authentic worship. Lord, you're mightier and bigger and stronger than this situation. It is who you are. I'm going to choose to praise who you are. You are good even when there isn't any goodness around me. God, you are good. You, we praise who he is. Number two, we declare his promises. The Lord has promised things to you. Pray and worship in those things. Lord, you promised to give me a hope and a future. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I'm going to praise and I'm going to speak his promises. You will keep me in perfect peace because I trust in you. These are the promises that you have made to me. And those things, they start to shift. As I, as I declare who God is and I declare the things that he's promised to do, all of a sudden it shifts the way that I'm going to look in the lens that I look at my circumstance with because I begin to look at it through a God who's mightier, through a God who has promised and is faithful to his promises. God, you showed up back then. So God, show up now. Number three, Pray for strength and boldness. I'm going to have the keys come up as we begin to close out of here. Pray for strength and boldness. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and John have just been released from prison. Um, they were in prison for healing a lame man at the, at the gate. And they get released, and they come back to the body of believers, and they begin to, to pray together. And they don't pray for a different circumstance. They don't pray that all of a sudden their external circumstance would change. I think God will change our external circumstance, but what they pray for is that they would have boldness within their circumstance. Lord, would you, would you see the things going on around us that are influencing us and, and they're wanting to drive fear into our lives and would you give us boldness to face it? They're not, they're not praying that all of a sudden this thing would go away. No, they say, give me boldness to stand before it. Give me boldness to face it. It says this in Acts 4, uh, 29 through 31, it says, Now look upon their threats and grant your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal. So continue to do the things that you're doing. Give us boldness and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed these things, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. That's an answer to prayer because the Holy Spirit brings boldness. It brings confidence to speak the word. It brings the confidence to stand in front of a situation, to walk around a, a city like Jericho, to shout when you're called, to shout, to stand in front of giants. And they continued to speak the word of God with all boldness. 
That's another suddenly moment because they chose to worship. Suddenly the Holy Spirit came in because they chose to praise God for who he is. Our God is a God of the suddenly. He's the God that shakes down walls. He breaks chains and shackles. He makes the sun stand still in the sky. He will strengthen his church. He will empower his people to continue to preach the word with boldness. He will give you boldness and will fight on your behalf when we choose to place him first in worship. These men were in their darkest days, bound in chains, dark dungeon, and Jesus showed up in the impossible. When it felt like they literally could not move, Jesus showed up in the impossible. Let me ask you this as we close this morning. What have you in your life declared to be too dark or too impossible for God to break through in? Is there an area that you said, this is, this is impossible? I can promise you that as you begin to praise him in that situation, he will show up in the suddenly and affect what's happening there. He wants to move. Let me encourage you to press in today. We're gonna, in a few moments, we're gonna receive communion together and then we're, we're gonna worship together. But here's what I, here's what I wanna like close and end on is this. We, we sang a song today, the grave shouts empty. The stone is rolled away. Heaven cries worthy. And we sing, Jesus is alive. That's a really powerful song right there. Let me just share this with you. That right there, the grave shouting empty, a stone being rolled away, and Jesus alive is the most powerful thing. That also was the most impossible thing. He was dead, locked in a grave, no hope. The disciples hid and mourned. There's nothing that we could deem more impossible than that. And yet the grave shouts empty. So what, whatever situation that you might have come in with today, it's not impossible if that was possible. It's not. And, and our part isn't to fight that battle. It's simply to sit and say, Lord, I'm going to trust that you're here and I'm going to worship. Man, when you get to that place, prison walls start shaking. Chains start breaking. Walls start coming down. That's a powerful place. And that's, what, that's where I want to end today is in that place. Let's pray.